powered by the Montana Television Network. This is the 10 o'clock news on KPAX, Montana's news leader. Good evening, I'm Dennis Bragg. And I'm Jill Valley. Breaking news tonight, Mineral County is now not only without a functioning jail, but it's now without a sheriff. MTN's Kent Lutzen has been developing this, uh, following this developing story tonight, and joins us now in the studio with more. Kent? Thanks, Dennis. Jail Sheriff Tom Bauer has resigned from his duties in the midst of the county jail closing less than three weeks ago. The jail closed on October 27th after safety concerns arose over the diminishing number of detention officers. Mineral County Commissioner Roman Zalawi said Bauer's resignation came four hours before an important meeting where the jail committee made recommendations to reopen the facility. The recommendations were to hire a jail administrator who would answer to county commissioners, obtain inmates, train new jailers, and balance the budget. However, to help pay for the position, they recommend to not fill an empty deputy position, which would then leave a safety concern with one less deputy. But Zalawi said, in, uh, said a possible grant opportunity could solve this problem. We would apply for a COPS grant, which Mineral County is eligible for currently, and hopefully receive it, in which the federal government pays for three years of a deputy. And that hopefully would happen within months of uh, the, the jail administrator going into place. So we would only hopefully be without that deputy for maybe four or five months instead of a longer period of time. In the light of tonight's resignation, Zalawi says they had to make an addition to their meeting's agenda to discuss the undersheriffs assuming of the new responsibilities. Dennis. Thanks. We'll continue to track that coverage, uh, uh, Kent. In other news tonight, the Missoula City Council votes unanimously to proceed with development of a new $80 million hotel and conference center. The vote gives Hotel Fox Partners the green light to start working on final designs and plans for the project at the Riverfront Triangle property on the west side of downtown. The Missoula Redevelopment Agency has been working on Hotel Fox for the past six years, hoping to pull together plans for the Riverfront Triangle property has been underutilized since the city acquired the old Fox Theater site in the mid-80s. Now, after nearly a year of negotiations, the city has an agreement where Missoula will provide the land for the hotel conference center and condominiums. Hotel Fox will build the facility and the city will own the conference center. Tonight, the full city council signed off on those contracts with council members calling the action a major economic boost for downtown without putting the city's general financial condition at risk. One of the things we really worked on was how do we minimize or eliminate ideally uh, any risk or requirement from the general fund and so there is zero um, input from the general fund needed on an annual basis and that's a really good thing. We can either look at a parking lot for the next few decades or we can do something where we're going to be compensated for the land that we own and we're also going to be investing in the future and creating a huge economic engine and an anchor on that side of downtown. It's expected to be another 18 months before the Hotel Fox designs are final. Eventually, the project could provide the anchor for the larger Riverfront Triangle development. And turning now to weather, we saw a little bit of everything out there today from fog to rain to sun. But what can we expect for the rest of the week? Here's meteorologist Russ Thomas with the first forecast. Russ. Dennis, I know you didn't know this, but you actually took my lead there. I was going to tell you we saw just about everything out there today for sure. And now we're going to see a clearing sky. It's going to not till tomorrow, but we are going to see uh, clearing conditions out there. In the meantime, you can see the showers, though, for much of western Montana have passed. You look in the Bitterroot Valley, though, and the mountains surrounding, we are still seeing that precipitation. Uh, as we move into the overnight hours, again, we're still going to see a few showers hanging on in most spots, but they are going to be few and far between. We look at our numbers right now. 30s, low 30s to upper 30s, depending on location. We'll have your complete forecast coming up in just a few minutes. 2017 is turning into a year of conflict between religions, races, political views. It's also seen a rise in anti-Semitism. Now, MTN's Jack Ginsburg is on special assignment to see one, how one Montana town has been a model for how to deflect hatred when it's on the rise. Just a few months ago, a group of white supremacists and neo-Nazis marched on the University of Virginia campus. You will not replace us! You will not replace us! The torchlight march was a precursor to a rally the next day, labeled Unite the Right. Protesters clashed with counter-protesters, and the rally became violent. At the height of the chaos, a white supremacist, James Fields, drove his car into a crowd of counter-protesters, killing one woman, Heather Hayer. As shocking as this rally may seem, recent findings show it wasn't as rare for the year 2017. According to the Anti-Defamation League's recent report, 2017 has seen a significant rise in anti-Semitic incidents. From January to September, 1,299 incidents have occurred, compared to 779 in the same time period last year, a 67% increase. Not only have these incidents risen since 2016,
but specifically since the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. 306 incidents were reported in July, August, and September, and 221 of those occurred either on August 11th, the day of the rally, or the month following. Just a little under a year ago now, here in the small ski town of Whitefish, Montana, there were talks of a white supremacist group organizing an armed march down Central Avenue on Martin Luther King weekend. After seeing the events unfold in Charlottesville, it posed the question, would we have seen similar incidences of violence and hatred if that rally occurred here in Whitefish? Watching the events in Charlottesville was terrifying because it was the worst of what we had expected. Um, that someone was killed was horrific. What started as an attack on a Jewish realty agent spread to the immediate Jewish community and ultimately became a full-on attack on the city of Whitefish. The city immediately started to plan for the worst in case the march happened. The Jewish community began to plan counter protests, but in a different area to ensure there was no violence and to steer the attention away from the hate group. City Council member Richard Hildner says the way the community responded was ideal in a difficult situation. The community really got together uh, and said, this is not who we are. These are not our community values. Our community values are values of inclusion. And uh, I just couldn't be prouder and I, I, people that I've talked to since, have said exactly the same thing. In a state where there are under 2,000 Jews, accounting for under 2% of the population, a city came together and took a stand against hatred. While it was um, terrifying and horrifying, um, we also knew we weren't alone. Rabbi Rostin received thousands of cards showing support, and the city was presented with a menorah from Jerusalem to honor their courage. Moving forward, the approach that Whitefish took against these attacks is something every community could learn from. Not only standing up to anti-Semitism, but hatred in all forms. It's important that everyone stand up for each other. Um, we certainly are highlighting what's been happening over this past year or two with rising rates of anti-Semitism, but we need to also all stand up against racism, homophobia, and other forms of bigotry. In Whitefish, Jack Ginsburg, MTN News. So far in just nine months of 2017, we have seen more anti-Semitic incidents than all of 2016 combined. The former Florence doctor accused of 22 felonies for misprescribing medication, including two negligent homicides, took the stand in his own defense in Ravalli County today. His defense attorney hopes to show Dr. Chris Christensen was actually a lifeline for patients who couldn't find care elsewhere with the medical background to help them. The premise of the defense's case is that Christensen is compassionate to a fault, a family doctor who took patients that no one else would. He established his upbringing and medical background in California and additional experience overseas before he ended up moving to Idaho to practice medicine in the early 90s. He says it's about that time that he also started to prescribe pain medications. He said he had a particular compassion for pain patients after growing up with a father who was a World War II veteran and an alcoholic. I realized that my I grew up with a chronic pain patient, a man who had cervicogenic migraines. I just looked back at my own life and what it had cost my family the divisions that it generated that existed from that time on. And I realized that, you know, that in a very palpable way, there were effects that untreated pain had on the dynamics of a family. The defense says it's likely Christensen will be back on the stand tomorrow, and it's expected the trial will wrap up sometime this week. Postal Fire Department says one dog survived, but nine others died after being caught in that weekend house fire in Polson. According to Assistant Fire Chief Terry Gambella, the couple escaped the house on West 10th safely and left the door open in hopes their pets could get out too. Gambella said the pet owners previously thought all their dogs had died, but they found out this morning one did make it out safely. Crews from Polson City, Polson Rural, and Finley Point Rural Fire Departments worked the fire, but the house is a total loss. Investigators are trying to figure out what started that fire. A longtime deputy says he's running to be the next Flathead County Sheriff in next year's election. Flathead County Sheriff's Office Patrol Commander Brian Haino is a 15 year member of the Flathead County Sheriff's Office. He was born and raised in the Flathead and was a U.S. Forest Service Ranger in the Jewel Basin. He started his law enforcement career as a police officer in Wyoming. Haino has tackled assignments in narcotics, SWAT, search and rescue, and has served on Two Bear Air Rescue. If elected, he says he wants to accomplish things like increasing staffing and improving technology.
we have a future growth issue that we need to deal with. We're going from a small community to a modern or more middle-sized community. Uh, second of all, we have um, we need more involvement with the community, and I think that we have a lot of I have a lot of ideas on that. Technology is another one. We have a lot of things that we can bring in, or I can bring in as your sheriff, to better and to make our agency more efficient, but also uh, be better at law enforcement. Flathead County Sheriff Chuck Curry has told us he hasn't yet decided whether or not he will be seeking another term. Coming up, Russ is back with the forecast for the rest of the week. And the Capitol Tree Tour makes a stop in Whitefish. We'll check it out. Still ahead here on KPAX.